enough announcements. Let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're going to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to do is our, our biblical backdrop for our talk today. Uh, Romans chapter 6, picking up, we're going to read in just a moment at verse 12. We are finishing, uh, the, today is the last uh, installment of this series that we've been in uh, called Uncensored, Uncensored, Biblical Perspectives of Sexuality. We've been, uh, been spending the last several weeks uh, talking through um, some principles of, uh, of what the Bible has to say about sex. I hope you've been with us. I hope you've been enjoying as we've been walking through uh, all of these messages. If you've missed any of them, uh, you guess where you can go? You can go onto the app and, <laughs> and you can catch all of the old messages. You can um, go to YouTube as well. Go to our YouTube channel. If you go to the YouTube channel, make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you never miss um, a, a message. But we, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about sex. Let me give my disclaimer as I have for every one of these messages. If you have children in the room um, and you're not comfortable with this type of subject matter uh, uh, with them in the room, you are welcome even now uh, to, to take your kids down to Kid Zone. Our Kid Zone staff is prepared to receive them and want to uh, receive them. If you are not comfortable with this subject matter, we've been uh, we've been treating this uh, this subject matter as uh, as bluntly and as openly as possible, as respectfully uh, as possible, um, giving it some levity but trying to keep it real. Amen. And so um, and so we want to encourage you if if you do have your kids with us and 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 they and you're struggling in this area, that's fine. I do also want to say. If you, if you got kids who are breaking double digits, who are preteens, uh, you probably want to make sure they stay. Uh, because uh, I guarantee you, if you're not having sex talk with them, somebody is. And I'm, and I'm certain that whoever it is, uh, you probably wouldn't approve of their perspectives. Um, and, so, and so I want to encourage you, uh, if you have small children who are coming into the preteen ages, um, please, encourage, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, uh, even though it might be uncomfortable, to really jump into, uh, to jump into these conversations uh, with both feet. Amen. Um, here's how I want to shut it down today, uh, because as we've been talking through all of these principles and I'm, I'm reflecting even on uh, whether I'm in marriage counseling or premarital counseling um, or just sitting down with some singles or sitting down with some married brothers, I get asked often, Pastor, is it really realistic to expect people not to be knocking boots? I mean, really, is it, is it, is it a realistic expectation, uh, Pastor, uh, for you to tell single people not to have sex? Is it really realistic for you to be telling uh, men uh, not to be looking at pornography? Is it really uh, realistic uh, for us uh, to tell a single woman um, who is grossly outnumbered by, uh, by single men and there are expectations that men have in relationships? Is it really realistic? to tell that single woman, to tell that single man that she's preserving herself until marriage? Do you know how many men uh, you're eliminating for our single women because, the single, because these, these men expect to be sexually active before marriage? Are, are, is, are you being, Pastor, I, hear, I know you read the Bible, Pastor, but are you being, are you being real? Are you being realistic? And my answer to that question, though it may be difficult to say and probably more difficult to hear, the answer to that question is absolutely yes, I'm being realistic. I'm being realistic, but let's be clear, I'm being realistic that this is an expectation for people who are disciples. That this is an expectation uh, for people who are Christ followers. This, this is not for somebody who is marginally religious. This is not, uh, this is not, uh, and, uh, this is not realistic. It's not realistic for somebody um, who is spiritual but not religious. This is not uh, an expectation for somebody um, who loved Jesus but got knees. This is not uh, a, uh, this is, it's, it's, you're right, it's not realistic uh, for somebody um, who is not a committed Christ follower. 
And this is one of the struggles for me um, as a pastor, to be honest, one of, one of the struggles uh, that I'm trying to figure out how to navigate as a leader, particularly um, in this generation, is this, that everybody want to be a Christian, but not everybody wants to be a disciple. Everybody want to go to heaven, but not everybody wants to do what it takes to follow Jesus while we're while we're here on earth. And so I want to talk about what this means, but I'm, I got to give this disclaimer that, uh, that, that honestly, yes, I feel like I'm being realistic, um, but I'm being realistic for people um, who have completely surrendered themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. People, because I, I need you to hear this and I need you to catch this, that if you have received the gospel and if you have embraced the implications of the gospel and if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that means that that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and you have been preserved not just for heaven one day but for power here on earth today and there is a power that's at work inside of you that's available to you if you want to be a Christ follower. The book of Romans lays this thing out. I, I want to read from chapter 6, but in order for you to understand chapter 6, we got to kind of give some background of the first five chapters. It, it, it lays out the implications of the gospel and what it really and truly means to be a Christian. Chapter 1, the apostle Paul says to these churches in Rome, he first he starts by saying, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. He says that the, the gospel is, gives us spiritual and actual power because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you jump to chapter three, that's where we find out the bad news that's at the basis of the gospel. The bad news is for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Chapter three lays down the necessary bad news in order for us to comprehend the good news. The good news is in the next chapter, chapter four, where it says we are justified by faith, that by placing our faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then we are then justified. Here's what that means. That means that even though chapter three says you are a sinner, chapter four says if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your sin has been covered. We are justified in chapter four. Then in chapter five, it, it tells us how we're justified. My favorite verse in the whole Bible, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says that Jesus displayed, expressed his love for us that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get it together. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait for us to dot all our I's across all of our T's. He didn't wait for us to earn uh, or be worthy of the salvation that he granted us. He, while we were still sinners, he died for us. He granted us justification even though we didn't deserve it. He gave us grace even though we didn't deserve it. Chapter 5 goes on to say where sin abounds, grace abounds abounds even more. It means you can't out sin God's grace. God's grace is so big that it can reach you wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you did, however far you went, and however long it took you to get back. Your, your sin is covered by a grace that's bigger uh, than your sin. Then you get to the beginning of chapter six. In chapter six, it says, now wait a minute, just in case you think you can wild out because God's grace is big. It says, shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound? Certainly not. Why? Because how can those of us who have died to sin live any longer in it? And then that's when he introduces this concept that leads us to our text for the day. He introduces this concept of us joining Jesus in his death and resurrection. What he experienced physically, we experience spiritually because we, like him, have died to our sin and have been resurrected so now we can live in Christ. And it's, this is the backdrop that is painted so that, so that we can talk about what we're trying to talk about today in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 12 is where we're going to go today, uh, where, where it says, okay, now because of all this, because of the gospel and because of the grace and because you're sinners, but because you're justified, by faith, because of all of that, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. He says, don't let sin, verse 12, reign in your mortal body. That word means to, literally means to be king. Don't let sin exercise authority in your life, even to a royal level. Don't let sin control you completely because sin is not your king. Jesus is. Sin is not the king. Jesus is. Sex is not king. Jesus is. Your lusts are not king. Jesus is. And so the challenge is for those of us who have partaken of the gospel and called ourselves disciples, the challenge is for us to live as if Jesus is king, not your private parts. Okay, here's how it's going to go. I see. I see y'all looking at me. Um, well, okay, so let me, let me see if I can break it down like this. Then uh, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Um, uh, Pastor, uh, how do I know? I hear what you're saying, and it sounds like it's from the Bible, but how do I know? Um, <laughs> how do I know that what's king in my life? Because I know I say Jesus is king, but let me make sure. I want to make sure based on the Bible that, that I'm telling the truth when I say Jesus is king. How do I know? How do you know uh, who, who, who is king in your life? There's a couple of principles in this passage. I just want to break them down if I can. The first way that you know uh, what is king in your life is by what you obey. What you obey. Check it. Verse 12. It says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. make you obey. In fact, notice it says in your mortal body. <laughs> that word mortal body just basically means that, that, you, that one day you'll die. One day, one day you'll die. He said, he said, don't let sin reign. Look, even though you feel like you're going to die. I got needs and I got flesh and I got desires. And if I don't have it, I feel like I'm going to die. He says, even though you feel like you're going to die, don't let sin be king. And ha here's how I know that, that I've let sin be king in my life. What do I obey? Y'all, sex is, is, a, is a harsh king. And it wants you to obey its every command. Click that. Go to that website. Talk to her. Go, go over there. Uh, send that what you're doing text it, 11:47 at night. <laughs> go around that corner, go down that block, stop at this person's house. Keep scrolling on Instagram, click it. Scroll and look at the rest of the pictures. <laughs> Try to see if I've gotten to everybody's yet or if I need to keep going. No, one more chapter of the romance novel. No, go get a... No oh, y'all ladies thought I was going to leave y'all alone, huh? Didn't you? Yeah, you thought... <laughs> and he says, he says, he says don't, don't let sex be king to the point that you're obeying its every command. And I know it. I feel it. I, I know. I feel the, the thirst is real. Look at somebody say, the thirst is real. But don't listen to Sprite. <laughs> Sprite. Sprite told you to obey your thirst as if your thirst is king. 
All right, let's do it this way. Everybody, everybody, close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes. I want you to imagine yourself. It's a hot day and you've been out in the yard working or you've been playing sports or you've been doing, or you've been exerting energy. You, you've been sweating and you're tired. You're breathing heavily and your mouth is dry. You imagining it? You're parched. Your mouth is dry and you hear this sound. thirsty how y'all feeling now <laughs> who wants some <laughs> refreshing Tastes great, satisfying. But y'all, just because something is refreshing and immediately satisfying does not mean that it quenches your thirst. What you mean, Pastor? Well, Sprite is carbonated. What does carbonation do when you pour it into a glass? It bubbles and dissolves the water. What do you think it does when it hits your stomach? It bubbles and dissolves the water in your body. This particular drink that they told you to use to obey your thirst, and just this one bottle has 76 grams of sugar. You know what sugar does when it gets into your body? It goes straight to your kidneys and it dissolves the water. Wow. And that's why you can be thirsty, drink a whole bottle of Sprite, and after you're done, still be thirsty because Sprite was not designed to quench your thirst. You know what does quench your thirst? Y'all, we use sex to attempt to quench a thirst that it simply does not quench. How many times do you say, I'm going to do it this one last time. I'm going to call it this one more time. I'm going to get it out of my system. I ain't going to do it no more after this, but I'm going to just do it this because I got this, I got this, and I'm going to do it one more time. But once I do it this one time, I'm going to delete the number, and I ain't never going to do it again. How many times have you done that, and, the, and you realize on the other side of it that you did it, and it didn't quench your thirst. It just made you more Okay, okay, there's, there's somebody in here who, who, who needs some Bible. I, you, you don't believe it's right, and so I got to give you some Bible. E Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 8, write it down. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 8, here's what the scripture says. It says, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. Watch this. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with with hearing. It's never going to be enough. Your eye will never be satisfied. Your ear will never be filled. You will, it, it will not satisfy. It will not fill you. It will only make you want more and it will only cause you to put whatever it is or whoever it is on a, on a throne that only is designed for God. How do I know that something's king in my life versus is who I or what I obey? The second thing, the second principle is here in verse 13. It's, it's what you obey, but the second principle is, uh, how do I know something's king? It's what I will sacrifice for. Watch the text, verse 13. Y'all got your Bible still? Verse 13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, 
but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Y'all following the text here is it's a juxtaposition of presenting the members of your body to sin versus the members of your body to God. Now, Paul normally doesn't bite his tongue, but maybe he, he for, for some reason in this passage, um, he, um, he, he tames his language a little bit by saying the members of your body. He's talking about your body parts, certain body parts in particular. Do y'all need me to explain further? I mean, I could, but I mean, I just, I figured we, we got it. He's saying your members, all of your members. And he's saying your members, you can bring as instruments of worship, but who will you bring them to? Uh, he's saying, he's saying, try not to, do not bring your members, present your members um, at, to put at someone's disposal. Don't present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but bring them to God as instruments of righteousness. He says, I want you uh, to, I want you to, because because here's what happened. Before you trusted Jesus as Lord, all of your 2,000 parts, you present it to sin. Now he's saying, don't continue doing that. Now that you've trusted Jesus as Lord, now that you are a Christ follower, now that you are committing yourself to holiness that goes along with being a Christ follower, I want to challenge you to cut off the supply of your members to sin and present them back to God as instruments of worship. Here's my question. Are you willing to sacrifice your members to God? Is it worth it? Is it worth all that? Is it that important to you that you live a life that's honoring to God and at the same time rejecting the desires of your flesh? Is it worth it? Some people might look at you trying to live for Jesus, trying to, trying to hold yourself in abstinence until marriage. You, if somebody might look at you and say, man, that don't even make sense. That's dumb. It just depends on which direction you're looking from. Oh, how, how can I say it this way? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, my favorite movie, my favorite movie is Forrest Gump. Y'all like Forrest Gump? I watched Forrest Gump. I, 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 know, I know it's one of my favorite movies in, in the whole world is Forrest Gump. Um, what, one of the, the tense moments in the movie, y'all, um, Forrest Gump just got back um, from war, and, and, and while he was at, in the Vietnam War, he was awarded the highest honor that a soldier can get. It's called the Congressional Medal of Honor. He got back uh, to the States. He had his Congressional Medal of Honor around his neck, and he ran into the love of his life, Jenny. <laughs> and while he's sitting there talking to Jenny, he takes off the Congressional Medal of Honor off of his neck, folds it up, and puts it in Jenny's hand. And all of us are yelling at the screen, no, do not give this medal to Jenny. Even Jenny says, I, Forrest, I can't, take, I can't take your medal. And Forrest says, Forrest says back to Jenny, I only got it because I did what you told me to do. Y'all remember early in the movie, Jenny was like, run! And that's all he did. That's what he did. He just didn't run for himself. He ran for everybody in his camp and he saved a whole bunch of people. So they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. And Forrest is saying, I'm, I'm giving it to you because I only did what you told me to do. And to all of us, it seems stupid until you realize that the whole movie of Forrest Gump is a testament of the fact that Forrest Gump is a disciple of Jenny. The movie begins with how he met Jenny, and then how he loved Jenny, and then how he fought for Jenny, and then how he ran for Jenny, and then how he named his boat after Jenny, and the movie ends with him praying to Jenny. For 
Forrest Gump is a Jenny disciple. And the value of the Congressional Medal of Honor pales in comparison to the value of Jenny in his life. And so he's willing to give the medal to Jenny, even though all of us think it's stupid, but his devotion to Jenny says, I will give this to you and more. I'm not talking about Forrest Gump. I'm talking about grace. I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about you and me. And if God is who we say God is, and if we are disciples of Jesus, then we should be willing to take whatever it is, including all of our members, and give it to Jesus and say, Jesus, you can do whatever you want with it because we only got it because because of what you did for us. What are you willing to sacrifice for? And how much time and how much effort and how many tears and how many relationships did you sacrifice on the altar of sexual pleasure? How much peace in your marriage did you sacrifice? Okay, okay. How do I know something's king in my life? It's about what I obey. It's about what I sacrifice for. Last thing is what I live for. I love what verse 13 says because it flows into what for, verse 14 says. Uh, verse 13 says, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God, watch this, as those who have been brought from death to life. He said, I, I brought you from death to life. If you're dead, then yeah, do, let somebody else reign. If you're dead, yeah, let sex reign. But you're not dead. I brought you from spiritual death to spiritual life. Then watch what he says in verse 14. For sin will not have dominion over you. Since you are not under law, you don't live under law, but you live under grace. This has been a revolving door. This has been a resounding message all throughout the book of Romans is this concept of grace. This grace that allows us to walk with Jesus in ways that we couldn't under our own power. He says you're not under Law. Now, the good news of not being under the law is that Christ, is this truth is that Christianity is not just a list of rules that God is keeping tabs of up in heaven. You're not under law. You're not trying to work so that you can so that God can be pleased with you. That's not what Christianity is. You're not under the law. You are under grace. The best way I can think to describe this is um, is 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 our honeymoon. We, 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 when we got married, we got married 13 and a half years ago, and, and one of the gifts to us um, was our, our honeymoon trip. Actually, our, our, my parents, they, they sent us on our, on our honeymoon, paid for it, and they sent us to an all-inclusive resort. Now, I didn't know what that was, but I was appreciative. Amen. Amen. And so we went to the all-inclusive Resort and and the the thing about an all inclusive resort, if you've ever been to an all inclusive resort, if you've never been to an all inclusive resort, you should give it a try. Um, <laughs> because when you get there, here's the concept: as long as you stay on the resort, you don't spend you don't spend any money. Because as long as you stay on the resort, everything is paid for, including tips. So when we got there, they, 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 they're taking us off, taking us, our stuff off the van. And, and I go to the back of the van because I figure, look, if I get my own bags, I ain't got to tip nobody. But they would not let me get my bag. Like, no, no, man, no, stay. <laughs> Save your energy, bro. And so they're, they're, getting, they're getting our bags off the back of the thing. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to tip you. So I reach into my pocket to tip the brother. He's like, no, man. 
he would not take my tip. Then, again, as long as you stay on the resort, everything's paid for, including the tips. And so we went to one of the restaurants. Now, y'all, this was one of the best steakhouses I had ever been to, right there on that resort. Great steak, incredible potatoes, size, just incredible. I mean, it was just, I mean, but as good as the food was, the service was even better. I mean, the, the, the dude was so good to us and took such good care of us. And then we ordered dessert and the brother get, went and got the dessert, took a napkin, put it on top of his head, balanced my dessert on top of his head and danced my dessert to the table. I wish I could make this up. This is exactly what happened. He danced my dessert to the table. After all that, I'm begging this dude. Let me give you, let me give you a tip for the, at least for the dance. At least for the dance. Can I give the brother a tip? And, and, and the brother helped me understand something that I said, man, I can't wait to get back home so I can preach this. He said, he said, no, 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 uh, I'm not serving you because I want something from you. This is an all-inclusive resort. You've already paid for all this. And so I'm not serving you because I want something from you. I'm serving you because I already got something from you. And he's describing to me what grace is. I'm walking and living under grace. And I'm grateful to serve Jesus with everything I got, including all my 2,000 parts. Not because I want something from him, because that would be the law. I'm, I'm worshiping God and I'm serving him the way that I do because I already got something from him. I already got his love and I've already got his peace and I've already got his grace and I've already been justified by faith and I've already received salvation. I've already been justified and because I got all that, I am so grateful to live for him because I don't live under the burden of law. I live under grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far. And it's grace that'll lead me on. It's grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Oh, amazing grace. How sweet that sound. Disciples, I need you to hear something. You live under grace. Disciples, I need you to hear something. You have been smeared with the grace of God. I need you to hear something so that you can walk out of this place empowered to take reign over your life and give it back to Jesus. I need you to hear this so that you can walk out of this place and clear your browser history and delete the phone number and then unfollow them people on social media. I need you to hear this so that you can get victory in places where you've been defeated sexually. I need you to hear this, that God is not not standing over the balcony of heaven waiting to shoot a, a, a bolt of lightning at you because you are not following the law. No, God is peering over the balcony of heaven with a broken heart, just wishing that you would let him be king because he's already given you all the grace that you need. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace. The grace that allows us not to have to work for something that we want from you. But your grace that says you've already given us every spiritual blessing. And so now our response to you is to give you everything we got. Because you gave us everything you got. I thank you for the gospel the gospel that says I'm a sinner because there's none righteous no not one but that same gospel that says while I was still a sinner Christ died for me 
that same gospel that says, because Christ died for me, I'm justified by faith in him. And that later in chapter 8, it says, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And later in chapter 10, where it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Thank you for the gospel. And thank you for your grace. And I pray that we would not just seek to have our ticket stamped to heaven, but that we would seek to be Christ followers and allow you to be our king and we to be your followers and disciples for, and for us to be willing to bring our members to you as instruments of righteousness. I pray for victory over sin today. I pray for power over our sexual urges today. I pray for grace to push forward. And even though everybody in the world will say it's stupid, everybody in the world will say it doesn't make sense. I thank you, God, that you take the foolish things to confound the wise. Challenge us by your word and by your spirit today. And we pray that you would give us victory as we clear off your throne so that you can take your rightful place as king. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, family, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to know it. Click subscribe, comment below, and hit us up on Facebook and Instagram at go to heights That's G-O, the number two, Heights. I'd love to see you this weekend at the Heights. For info on our campuses and service times, find us online at fbcdh.org. I'll see you soon. God bless.